What is up, everybody? It's Alex from Heavy New York. We are back at the Brooklyn Bazaar, and we return after nearly two years with Matt of Exhumed. Thank you so much for your time, man. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Nice to be back in New York. Yeah, it's always great to have you back here. Cheers. Yeah, so the last time we spoke, you just put out uh, Death Revenge, your latest record, but now uh, you have uh, your new record, Horror, out. You want to talk about the, how the making of this record was, the recording and all that fun stuff? Uh, the making of this record was uh, totally insane. <laughs> Basically, we, um, through a series of circumstances ended up moving we have a screen printing shop where we do a lot of our own merch and we also had a rehearsal studio we merged those into one uh facility i don't know it sounds very official but <laughs> we moved those into one space and we kind of didn't realize when we moved that we wouldn't be able to rehearse there and so we had to build a rehearsal room and then we started looking at the cost and soundproofing and so on and so forth and we realized that it was going to be really expensive and for, you know, a, a modest increase on what we would already have to spend, we could also build, build it out to be a recording studio. So we, and the, the, ben, the benefit there would be that we could, you know, get the label to pay us to make a record and therefore finance building this thing rather than coming up with the money ourselves. So, uh, at the beginning of this year we started building and, um, we were leaving for a three-week Latin American tour in April, and we had to be done by April 1st. By, we got finished building uh, everything. Uh, I think it was March 18th. Wow. So <laughs> we were really down to the wire, and it, so it was a lot of work, not just the normal, like learning the songs and you know playing the material and getting good performances, but you know hanging out drywall and going to Home Depot for four hours, buying <laughs> insulation and researching on how to build this shit and getting all the gear installed and so it was uh it was pretty fucking intense quite the learning experience <laughs> well yeah we we uh kind of dove in at the deep end and we're like well you know this this better work <laughs> and I, I think it did so it turned out okay yeah do you consider this record like conceptually to be the direct follow-up to uh, death revenge was the last record or death aggression i keep death revenge that's death, fun yeah um it's so it's kind of a response. I don't know if it's a follow up. Um, you know, we kind of with Death Revenge, we we went sort of more expansive. You know, we had this whole storyline, and we had uh, you know, it was all based on historical events. I did all this research, and we put together these sort of like film theme interludes and stuff. And you know, we had like a, I wanted. I think the instrumental was like seven minutes or something like that. So we, I felt like we kind of pushed as far as we could in this sort of big um macro kind of direction while still you know being the same band not doing like a cold lake or whatever kind of thing um so this is sort of a reaction going the extreme opposite direction mm -hmm. um you know that the last time was sort of this like highbrow historical period piece and then this new record you know i think the longest song on the record isn't even three minutes um most of the songs are under two minutes, uh, and they're all sort of like B-grade zombie slasher kind of, you know, themes and stuff. So I don't know if it's a follow-up, but it's definitely a response, you know? Interesting. Was it a preconceived idea going into making this record that this is what you kind of wanted the theme to be, or did it kind of just come out of nowhere, this idea? Um, usually, like, I, I try to wait like a few months after we do a record, and then kind of see what feels natural. I think that, you know, if the last album of Death Revenge had really taken off and all of a sudden we were making more money and playing bigger rooms or something, then I might think like, oh, we're really on to something with this concept bit. Like, we should do another one. But, you know, I mean, we kind of slowly peter along on our normal trajectory and that, that didn't really seem to change too appreciably. So um, I just kind of went with what, what, what kind of felt natural. Um, and, you know... I had some, some material sitting around already that was sort of shorter and faster, and I was like, well, I'll just adapt that to this album and then sort of build off that. And luckily, uh, my only concern <laughs> was that when I was done writing, I was like, fuck, we only have 25 minutes of songs. So I talked to Relapse, and I was like, is this an album? Because if this is an album, I can ask you guys for the money to build the studio. If this is not an album then you're kind of screwed <laughs> right so they were cool with that though we we recovered or we recorded uh three cover songs just to make sure that we hit 30 minutes in case they were gonna balk at the idea of putting out a 25 minute record but 
they were into it. So yeah, here we are. You led me into my favorite question, actually. How do you know when a song is done? <laughs> I mean, generally, you know, that there is a, a, a formula or a s- sort of science to it, I guess, you know, like you listen to a song on the radio or like a traditional rock or metal song even, and generally a song has three choruses, two or three verses, a bridge, maybe an intro, maybe an outro, and you know, once you kind of cycle through that loop, then you're like, all right, well, that's a song, you know? Um, of course, it's not, you know, it's not just like, bang, 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 like taking pieces and moving them around. It's not that simple. It is something that, it's a gut feeling, but um, you know, there is a, a kind of, <laughs> there's a science to it. There's a, a, a system. Um, and I, I find that to be really helpful when I'm writing because then I'll hear a part and because I'm also, you know, the primary vocalist, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about singing over the riff as soon as the riff is there. And I'm like, Oh, I, I don't want to sing over this. or I think this would be more interesting not to be singing over or like, Oh, this is perfect for this kind of singing rhythm. And then, you know, you can pretty much tell that if it's a good chorus or a good verse or, or whatever, you know, you said you need like the music in order to come up with lyrics, right? It's not like you have, yeah. cause you mentioned like you had a theme from death revenge and a theme kind of like in this particular record as well. Does, is there ever a time where maybe like the theme or even a lyrical idea could determine the music itself? Not so much. It might determine more just like the cadence, you know, like if you have a, um, like a song title, it's easier to, you can rearrange the accents and the riffs so that if, you know, you have a song called Bleeding Guts and the chorus goes bleed or bleeding guts, you just go bleeding guts and then your hits are sort of right there on the thing and it gives a little bit more emphasis to it, but not not really. I mean, if I'm writing something with a vocal melody, that's a, that's a lot different because then you can come up with a cadence and a melody and then that sort of determines how the, the chords move underneath it, yeah. you know. One thing I always thought that melodic vocals had, like, is that, because I feel like with guttural or death metal vocals, it it has to really follow the rhythm, but, like, I feel like with melodic vocals, you can, like, sustain it a little bit more. Absolutely. I mean, that's one of the things, you know, playing this kind of music, it's like trying to paint a a compelling picture, but you only have, like, half of the colors, you know, Um, which is kind of a fun challenge. And, I mean, honestly, you know, to me, it's more difficult writing sort of atonal chromatic type riffs that still are hummable rather than if you're writing something with melody it's just like well yeah you fucking follow the scale and then maybe throw in some contrast notes like you know people like oh wow melodic death i'm like this shit's easy to write you know fucking scale like you follow the scale i'm not i'm not saying it's not good or not compelling or whatever but i think there's it's a lot more challenging to try to write something that's hummable and catchy and musical when you're dealing with these really atonal or ugly kind of intervals and you have no vocal melody to speak of you know it's an interesting uh it's an interesting aesthetic to work with and because it's got a lot of challenges inherent to it that playing other kinds of music don't necessarily yeah, yeah it's almost kind of like the art of organized chaos and right 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 yeah. you know because it has to be intense and it has to be brutal and it has to be chaotic and kind of overwhelming feeling but at the same time if it's just that there's not that much for the listener to come back and sort of latch on to, especially because everybody's been hearing these kinds of records now for, you know, it's scum by Napalm Death is what, 32 years old at this point. So we've heard blasting chaos noise. Like it's not enough for it to just be like loud and fast. It has to have some kind of substance to it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when it comes to um, like the inspiration for writing, do you have to like put yourself in a certain element or a certain atmosphere like you mentioned you were working on your own studio this year so like maybe being in like your own sort of like uh environment maybe helped a little bit with the writing process or does inspiration sometimes just come out of nowhere you know it's more just like um i I, i'm not really a big fan of the term inspiration because it makes it sound so magical Mm -hmm. and i think that like it's great people love those kinds of ideas because they're romantic and like oh you're such an artist like wow and it's like it's more just I think of it more like um, I just train myself to listen. Like if if I hear a phrase or a word or you know if I'm reading something, I'm like, oh, that's good. Like, cool. I'm gonna make a fucking note of that and save it for later. And it's you know almost the same thing with the music. Um, the last several years, I've been using this program called Guitar Pro. Um, 
who I'm not endorsed by, but I could be because I'm saying good things about it in the press. But um, <laughs> anyway, I, and basically I, I tab out everything I write. And then sometimes you can write like a whole song in, in an hour. Sometimes you just get a, a riff or a piece or whatever. And then you just kind of, I'm able to file it away and I don't have to worry about remembering it. And I can sort of come back to it later and see if it works or whatever. So, I mean, I think it's sort of, a constant like I, I'm, I'll work on stuff in the van if I get an idea at work I'll you know I'll transcribe it on my lunch break I also work for a company where we're building uh, electronics for instruments so there's like guitars and basses just sitting around in my work so that helps too um, but I think it's just more of like constantly incrementally building up these ideas and then sort of once you have an idea of the theme of the record or the, the theme of the song, then you're like, oh, cool, I have this piece over here and I have that over there, and that's great. And then you're able to sort of build it up that way. Um, I mean, I'm always writing something. <laughs> so. There you go. You mentioned like you don't like the term inspiration. I think that's actually a good way because sometimes like I feel like if you are enslaved to inspiration or like just like you only do something when you're inspired, like how, how does that like – you know, there's no, like right. my tattoo artist said that if I only tattoo when I'm inspired, then I wouldn't be paying my rent. Right. And I think the other thing for me is that, you know, again, that there's an idea that inspiration impels the work. Whereas for me, work impels the inspiration. You know, it's like if you're working on any project, like whether it's a spreadsheet for your dumb ass job or, or, you know, working on trying to figure out what's wrong with a car as you keep working, the pieces sort of come together and you're like, boom, that's work that comes moment. out of work. Right. And so to me, the, the process of the work is the, the interesting thing because you know, it's not like, Oh, I went into a fucking forest and like communed with my ancestors and I came out with this album or, you know, I took LSD and I came back with this great song. It's just like, come on, dude, you're just plunking away at a fucking guitar and eventually a good idea is going to come and you put it together in a cool way and that's it you know yeah yeah jeff loomis says though no matter what he does he always has the uh, the record button on so smart i mean you know i don't that's like me and transcribing i'm like dude write write it down or else i'll fucking forget it yeah, yeah. and i have two more questions for you cool. um you know as somebody who has seen you live this is, i think it'll be like my fifth time seeing exhumed live so like um what i was curious is you know i i've always thought it was a very different experience just seeing you live versus just listening to the album for you is cool. there a certain method of executing your songs live versus when you're in the studio or is there maybe like a similar method behind like the madness I mean, I think for us, you know, we're trying to sort of incorporate um, uh, some element of spectacle, you know, uh, especially in death metal. The most common uh, live show is just four guys in jeans nodding in unison as they play. And that's great. And, you know, that's killer. But to me, I, as someone that's been listening to death metal since like 89 or whatever, I find that to be you know, not necessarily compelling on its own unless I'm really familiar with the music or whatever. Um, and also I find that it's a way that we have to sort of differentiate uh, ourselves from other bands and that, you know, we have a mascot and we have, you know, some level of theatrics. It's like, you know, if Iron Maiden's production budget was like a hundred bucks, <laughs> that's kind of where we're at. Um, but in terms of executing the songs, you know, in the studio, it's all very meticulous and controlled and you go back and you do it again and again and again. And, you know, um, whereas live, you know, you're always going to make mistakes or you're always going to play with less clarity simply because you're, you can't hear well or you're tired or you're getting a cold or somebody's running around in front of you or jumping off the stage or whatever. And so you kind of pick your priorities. <laughs> Sometimes I'm like, oh, fuck, here comes a mistake. I'm like, well, I'm, if I keep singing, no one will probably notice if I hit the wrong fret there, this one thing. So it's kind of, you know, you're, you're doing your best to sort of balance accuracy with presentation. And, you know, there's a lot of bands who take the musicality so seriously that they would rather just like stand there and, and play everything really precisely, but we're not delivering like that sort of technical finesse driven music. We're playing more like rock and roll infused, you know, like, where the balls are more important and it's like if you can shake your guitar in someone's face and like scream at them while you're playing 
that's maybe more important than if you know every single 16th note is accurately picked or yeah. whatever so that's kind of my philosophy you yeah know? i feel like your uh, live shows are very very organic like you are very raw in what you do and i think what people see is what they get in a way yeah i mean that, that's something that we've kind of adopted uh, as, a, as a philosophy you know i think that and the, the really cool thing is that um our drummer mike hamilton he was playing with deeds of flesh for years and so he's sort of in, on the more meticulous side and you know i was like you know if you want to like twirl your sticks or like stand up he's like uh what so he's sort of holding things down musically so and it's it's important that you know it's the drummer <laughs> your drummer sucks your band sucks right so that's the most true shit ever so as long as you know he's sort of driving the car then we're allowed to hang our heads out the windows or you know play with a fucking radio station or what are all the annoying things kids do in the car because <laughs> we've got an adult at the wheel so as long as he's playing well then you know everything else is going to fall into place there you go and uh the final question i wanted to ask you is before we start rolling i'd love to do a gear talk uh with you like uh just what is some of your weapons of choice in terms of guitars amps pedals um i have a my rig is growing slightly more elaborate i guess as time goes on um I've been working with the ESP for the last couple of years as far as guitars. Um, I somehow managed to talk them into uh, <laughs> getting me a, a, an arrow from the custom shop in Japan. I didn't know that that was what I was asking for because I wouldn't have thought that they would say yes. I just was like, can you make it in white? And they're like, sure. And then I was like, where's the guitar? Usually it ships like really fast. And like, oh, no, we're, we're, we're making it at the custom shop in Japan. And I was like, <laughs> so that's my main guitar um i have a uh eclipse uh, like an ltd deluxe eclipse uh as my backup it's really comfortable uh it took me a little bit to get used to that sort of like les paul body but for that latin american tour we did this year i knew i was gonna be flying every day and the arrows which is giant v with huge fins the fucking case is like you know the size of like a pantry door and it can be very problematic on planes. They try to charge you more. They try to, you know, this and that. So I was like, I need something small. And I grew to really like the Eclipse. Um, I still got to have the, the Floyd Rose on there, of course. Um, I use Seymour Duncan Blackouts um, for Exhume. For everything else that I do that's in D, I use the, uh, the Mick Thompson Blackouts because they have a little bit more scoop in the mid-range, but because Exhumed, we have a lower tuning, so we need all the mid-range we can get, you know? If you're already two and a half steps lower than a normal guitar, you don't need to crank as much, you know, low end. Um, and then I have, uh, my effects are sort of a, a hybrid of Maxon stuff, and then uh, we, have, we have a guy named Michael Klein that has been building some custom pedals for us, so I have like a, a preamp, rig that at home i didn't bring both rigs on tour because it's just a little bit too much gear but i have a preamp rig at home that's all my custom stuff and then i and that's just going through the power section of a old pv vtm and then i have my sort of normal rig i guess i would call it which is a 6505 plus with the usually the max on od808 uh, or the super distortion in front of it. i had the super distortion for death revenge and i've kind of found myself drifting back to the OD-808. Um, and then uh, Michael Klein designed the best noise gate I've ever used. It's fantastic. So I, I have that and, of course, you know, a tuner and whatever. Yeah. Um, and then just uh, Line 6, uh, the G60 relay or whatever it is, the wireless unit. Um, and uh, I have a, a really nice... I, I was talking with, with Michael and I was like, well, you know, my problem is that with a lead channel i didn't use a lead channel for years because i was like it's just too much tap dancing and then you know using the effects loop or whatever and i was like i just and it's also you don't want to bring a fucking pedal board that's you know the size of a desk yeah it's like tom morello right and because then it's just unwieldy and, and he's like well check it out what if we built a delay reverb pedal that also includes a volume boost and i was like perfect because then even if, you know, if I didn't have the, the effect switcher for the amp, which I do, but even if I didn't have that, it's still only just one fucking button and then you're ready to go. And it works wonderfully. We use it on the record. Um, it's fantastic. So awesome. 
thank you so much. Cheers. Is there just uh, anything else you would like to promote for Exhumed uh, after this tour with uh, Gate Creeper? Um, this will be uploaded by midnight, so if it hasn't been announced yet, don't don't. <laughs> uh, We do have some stuff in the works for next year, but, uh, you know, we've been really stoked with... Uh, how the record's gone and I just you know thanks for supporting the band and, and checking us out awesome well thank you so much man fuck yeah man thanks yep everybody we are here with Matt of Exhumed Horror pick it up if you haven't already this is Alex from Heavy New York we'll see you next time cheers